I want to introduce my good friend and mentor, David Cuzzo. Uh He is the retired, well, I have it written down. He's an ethnobotanist and the director emeritus of the revitalization of traditional Cherokee art artisan resources program from Cherokee, North Carolina. He's a former cooperative extension agent for the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. Special agent. Special agent. <laughs> uh, he received his PhD from UGA in 2004. Go Bullfrogs! <laughs> his dissertation is a reconstruction of the Cherokee ethnobotanical knowledge system. And he, uh, it encompasses over 800 plants native to the southeast and southern Appalachia. And he worked extensively in the collection at the Smithsonian Institute. He has also worked to make native people working on the front lines of conservation visible and to expand public knowledge about native plants and indigenous knowledge. So please uh, welcome David Cousin. Thank you. I didn't know I did all that. Y'all hear me all right? Okay. I'm going to talk to you today about River Cane, the subtitle Cultural Workhorse and Ecological Powerhouse. You may, that sounds like a pretty dramatic title, and you may say, why so dramatic? I'm glad you asked, and I'm about to tell you why. So, the star of the show today is River Cane, Arundinaria gigantea. I came to be very interested in River Cane through my, the project. Uh, it was my first and only job out of graduate school, and I ran the revitalization of traditional Cherokee artisan resources. I'm not going to talk a lot about that today because uh, I just found out that they lost their, their funding and there probably won't be a, a, an RT car program after um, about October. So, <laughs> But our mission statement was to, pre to preserve, protect, and teach the heritage of Cherokee traditional resources, land care, and culture. So um, this was a wonderful thing coming out of UGA from the anthropology department as somebody who specialized in Cherokee ethnobotany, I got the only job I was qualified for, and I got it, and it was great. It was a wonderful program, um, but the reason it was established was because the Cherokee Preservation Foundation, which was set up when um, the state was going to uh, allow the Cherokee to have a casino, and they said one of the stipulations would be that they would set up a, uh, a, sec a independent foundation from the tribe that would uh, do certain things in the area such as uh, environmental preservation, uh, ecological preservation, and workforce development were their, their three goals. Um, but they started doing all these classes for, um, for uh, cultural preservation and teaching the artists and they realized that the natural resources that the artists, the artists need were, were already strained. They were already hard to come across. And they wanted to make it an independent program because we needed to engage like research institutions. Uh, we gave grants out all throughout this, the region and other regional partners. So it was outside of their funding range. And uh, so we, we started out at Western Carolina University and ended up moving to Cooperative Extension in Cherokee for the last 10 years. So this was our threefold strategy, ensure the availability of natural resources for Cherokee artisans, preservation of traditional cultural knowledge, and pr the preservation of culturally significant plants. And we dealt with a lot of the like basket materials and dye plants. Uh, we did some things with, with finding clay resources, but the the potters would rather go buy clay than dig it, and I don't blame them one bit. And we looked for sources of like soapstone and wood for the carvers. But our basket materials, there were four primary basket materials that are, that are used to make a Cherokee basket. Uh, river, river cane, white oak, honeysuckle, and maple. Um, when, we give, when I give this talk to conservation groups throughout the region, there's always a hand go up on honeysuckle. That's an exotic uh, invasive species. For the purpose of, in, you know, of environmental preservation, it is. For the purpose of Cherokee basketry, it's an artisan resource. But the star of today's show is River Cane, Arundinaria gigantea. So what is River Cane? 
I'm glad you asked. They're a curious group. Arundinaria gigantea is the largest species of Arundinaria, which is our only native North American species, genus of bamboo. So the Arundinaria genus is the only one native to North America. Historically, it was said it uh, reached as much as 40 feet high. Some accounts said it was as big as a man's thigh. But I think in the 1700s, men's thighs were much smaller than they are today. The largest cane breaks occur on alluvial floodplains where it tolerates inundation but not prolonged submergence. No wet feet. This is not a wetlands plant. Some people you know, tend to try to put it in that group of wetlands plants. It is not in wetlands. It likes to be drained. Cane breaks were often rejuvenated by burning every seven to ten years. More frequent burning was considered detrimental. I think seven to ten years is, uh, is a little, it takes, it takes five years for a newly transplanted uh, comb of river cane to start sending out rhizomes. So, you know, I, I think it would have been a little more, maybe ten years at, at the least. Cane breaks once covered large areas of the southeastern United States, but it's estimated today that less than 2% of the original cover remains and it's a critically endangered ecosystem. It's not an endangered plant. You'll see sprigs of it all, all along the rivers, but the ecosystem is, is considered endangered. The distribution of river cane, this is mostly a southeastern plant. Cane was once an essential material in the lives of southeastern Native Americans. Charles Hudson, who, was, uh, who taught here for many years, and he was actually on my doctoral committee, uh, he referred to river cane as the plastic of southeastern Indians. So it, was, it, was, um, it would have been an integral portion of their lives. We see a lot of these debris, debris prints in, in the literature of southeastern Native Americans. Now, he was Dutch. He'd read descriptions and he made all these prints without ever being in the New World. So everything he did was, uh, was from description. So you look at his prints and you see the gardens and they're, they're pretty close. You see the houses and the layouts and they're pretty close. But one thing you don't see is river cane in any of his cuts. There would never have been a southeastern village without river cane close at hand. And you will see why in a little bit. This is from uh, John Swanton, Indians of the Southeastern United States in 1947. Cane supplied one of the most important of all raw materials. Besides the use of its seeds for food, it was employed in making baskets and mats, as building materials, in making fishing creels and traps, spears and arrows, backing for wattle walls, in making beds in houses, and in the construction of corn cribs as a substitute for the shuttle in weaving, as knives and as torches, in the spiral fire at creek councils, in making boxes and, candle, and cradles, sieves, fanners, hampers, blowguns, blowgun arrows, shields, stockades, and fences, rafts, litters, flagellets, counters, and drills, and tubes through which to blow into medicines as pipes to blow, in, blow the fire in burning out mortars and in smoking. And sometimes a section was employed to hold the braids of the hair. Useful and lovely at the same time. So, for processing river cane, um, it was really interesting. I, I went out with a bunch of... Uh, Cherokee basket makers one time, and we were going to go out and look at some areas of cane. And I hadn't really seen what useful cane looked like. And we got to, uh, we went to all these different sites, and they looked at the cane, and they could be a quarter mile away and see the cane break and say, no, it's not ready yet, or it's not good yet, or it's too green. And I said, well, how do you know? And they could tell just by looking at how the, the edge of the cane break looked. If the taller cane had a heavy top on it, it would lean over, they'd know it was mature. And they could, look at it, they could look at the color of it and see it hadn't matured yet. 
And we got to this one stand and we walked in and there were these big, beautiful, old columns, 18 to 20 feet tall. And the only thing they said was, get the tools. And they got them a real nice truckload of cane. So what, the way they would process cane is they would um, split out a, a piece. They would start at one end and split a piece. And you can use your knife to keep it the same width. And the way it works is like if it starts getting narrow, you turn your knife the other way and split. And it's like splitting the way they used to rive boards. It works the same way. You know, with a, with a fro, you would switch it to, to steer how the split would go. They do the same thing with their knives. And I learned early on, well, a friend of mine uh, was in the old IGA store there one day. And he was standing there looking at a case of uh, case knives. He was looking at the display. And he said, uh, this one really old Cherokee woman came up and she goes, get that one. And she whips out her knife and he said the blade was out. He said he felt like he was in downtown L.A. I mean, somebody pulled that knife out and the blade came out. And uh, then this other old woman came up and said, no, get this one. That's the one I've got. And he started backing up and realizing they're all armed. <laughs> Everybody in Cherokee carried a pocket knife. And, but, and, you know, for processing cane, that knife had to be razor sharp. So they'd split a piece out. And then they would go and get that outer surface of the cane. There's a, a, like a glaze on it. It's, it's actually silica. And they would split that outer portion out. They would scrape out anything that was on the inside. And you see that in the middle uh, picture there. Scrape it out. And then they would uh, dye it, roll it up, and, and dye the different, use the different uh, dyes on it. And weave it into the lovely baskets you see here. Now, one of the things we got to do you know, is cultural preservation was part of our program, is we, uh, we actually funded um, River King basketry back at the high school. There hadn't been any River King basketry done at the high school since the 60s. And um, this was, I think, about 2008. And um, young woman at the top right, you're right. Um, that's Hannah Youngdeer. She made the first Cherokee uh, River King basket to come out of that school since the 60s in 2007. And the young fella down below made the first double weave basket um, that same year. So she got credit for the first in a long time, and he got credit for the double weave. He was a little slower. Um, double weave basket, all that is, is uh, they, we start with the inside of the basket, they weave the inside of the basket, fold it over at the top, and weave an outside of the basket so it has a finished surface on both sides. Those are the really, the really high-quality Cherokee baskets. Some of the cane mats, they still, um, they get very creative with the designs on these mats. Um, they're mostly now used for wall hangings, but historically, said the woman wove mats ordinarily six feet long by four feet broad, and they were woven in designs. Mats were used in everyday life in the home for sitting, sleeping, and flooring. Mats were woven to wrap the bodies of the deceased. Priests stood on mats while preparing medicine with herbs in council meetings. Clan members sat on mats and on benches and under hanging mats woven with their clan designs. One, a Spaniard who first noticed these, these mats noted, with these materials, these Indians make neat and well-woven mats. And by throwing four, five, or six of them on top of each other, they fashion a roof which is useful as well as beautiful. Neither sun nor water could penetrate these mats. So a lot of the baskets, too, they would weave them so tight they would actually carry water. So. Blow guns. This is my buddy Davy Arch. It looks like the blow gun's about to pull him over, but it didn't. Um, and you'll notice these darts. These darts are fletched with thistle down. And I've, I watched uh, one of the elders make one one day. And they collect a bunch of thistle down from the tall thistle. And they'll just take it and pull it all out. And they'll roll it along the edge. And then just wind it up with, uh, well, dental floss works great. But I think there's more traditional things. And they would tie 
this, this fletching onto these arrows, and uh, it would make uh, you know these blowgun darts go pretty hard, pretty far, and pretty fast. Um, we had we had one of these blowguns in in the office. I was uh, at the Tribal Historic Preservation Office for many years, and there was a blowgun there. And I picked it up, and I was looking down the bore because you know supposedly it was a pretty tricky to make one of these, and I'm looking at it, I said, this is all wrong. This is just going to blow the dart right into the ground. And I turned it 180 degrees, and they had worked this blowgun so that the weight of the blowgun itself would straighten itself out. And when you turned it the right way up, it was perfectly straight, and the bore was right down there. Um, this, these blowgun darts... One of the things I studied was Cherokee naming of, of plants. And the name for the, the tall thistle was tsetse. And the reason it was tsetse is because that's the sound the blowgun, when the blowgun dart comes out, it goes tee, tee. So that's the only case of onomatopoeia I found for a, for a naming of a plant. A little ethnobotanical aside there. The atlatl. Um, one of the earliest weapons in the southeast, the arrows would have been made from, from cane. And, of course, the arrow shafts. Again, another Debray print. Um, and what, dandy, what Cherokee dandy would have been complete without a, a nice, nice case full of river cane arrows? They, they, they didn't tell them how they stood. But, Traps and these fish traps, you can still, um, if you look in the, um, some, uh, go up some of the rivers in the mountains, you'll see these stones out in the, out in the rivers, shape of a V. And they would make a river cane basket that would go at the end of that, dr go down the river, drive the fish into the tip of the V, and the fish would get caught in the basket. For warfare, when the DeSoto expedition traveled down the Mississippi River, they encountered warriors carrying cane shields, and these shields would resist crossbow arrows, which uh, were pretty powerful. DeSoto's men also observed that the cane breaks provided superior cover for small raiding parties. The raiders, raiders would just disappear back into the cane after they attacked. Flutes. And, of course, their housing. The wattle and daub. Summer houses were of wattle and daub construction. Uh, posts were set in the ground, a river cane would be woven in between the posts and in a, sort of a basket style, and then mud or clay was used to plaster the walls. Um, also, cane benches were used to line the walls. I do want to point out that the backpack and water bottle are not traditional. Uh, they were added for scale. No, I didn't add them. I stole it off the Internet. Now, food. When we think about Native America, we think, well, they ate corn. You know, corn was their, their grain, their primary grain. And it's true. And we think, well, they didn't have wheat. They didn't have oats. They didn't have any of these other grains. But river cane, you can see this. Uh, this small cane was about three feet tall. And you see the number of, of um, heads of grain that are on there. Well, you can imagine what a 15-foot comb of river cane would look like with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these uh, heads of grain on them. Um, now, it wasn't, like, um, it wasn't like wheat, which was domesticated and doesn't uh, ar disarticulate all at once. You know, it kind of holds together. Uh, that was from years of selective breeding. With river cane, you could run your hand over one of these, and it would rain down seeds. Now, I've only seen this once. I've only had uh, one... You need, you need two flowering events within, um, within uh, cl close enough that it can, it can actually pollinate. It um, doesn't like to pollinate itself. And a lot of river cane you'll see, you'll see a lot of cane, but it's one plant. It's all clonal. It's all attached underground. So for comparison, that's river cane seed at the top, rye, and oats, so river cane seed looks like a large, actually a large rye seed. Um, the grains are maybe twice as big. 
And they say about it, there is some evidence that the Indians, by burning the cane brakes, were able to make them bear more regularly than they do naturally. Young shoots of the cane were used much as asparagus is now. And that's from the beginnings of agriculture in America from Carrier. Um, so yeah, I've met, um, I've met people who would go out to harvest cane. They'd take their kids with them, and the kids would be chewing on the little cane stalks. And they'd say, they don't eat all the cane. But those seeds, actually, um, there were so many. Um, when I went out to harvest, I had a bucket, and I would just take it and run my hand over. In 20 minutes, I filled out a bucket up with seed. Um, I have taught wild foods class. I taught a wild foods class down at, uh, at Western Carolina. And so I said, OK, I've read that you can eat river cane flour. You know, it's, it's a good grain. So I, I got out, took my gloves, and it, you know, it wasn't bred to lose its hull easily. So I spent hours and hours and hours and hours getting the hulls off of it. And then I ground it all up. And uh, I decided I was going to make biscuits with it. Y'all have seen like those Martha White biscuits. They come and they look like they're going to float off your plate. Mine didn't look like that. Uh, actually, the National Hockey League wanted uh, my recipe. Uh, they were dense. But they were very tasty. This is a really nice taste. It tasted like uh, graham crackers almost, a graham flour. So it had a wonderful flavor. I've heard of people making bread with it. I was not that ambitious. Um, but because it doesn't flower and seed that often, um, I mean, there are people that have been following River Cane for years who have never seen it flower and seed. And um, so. You would have to really know how to manipulate it. You would have to know how to work it. But the amount of seed that came off of one plant, um, if you got a whole cane break to flower at once, you would have gotten a lot of food material. And the neat thing about it is this started in, I want to say it started in April. You would see the plant, and the plants would start losing their greenness, and you would, they would look uh, almost purple. The anthocyanins would come out. Um, and then you would know it was about to, about to go to seed. I mean, I remember a big gathering out at the, the mother town in Kadua, and, you know, I'm sit, standing there with a couple of Cherokee fellows, and we're looking out at the cane, and they looked at me and they said, Dave, what'd you do to the cane? Because <laughs> it was starting to flower. So it, it will all die. It'll flower, and that whole area will die. I saw one, one area. I didn't catch it in flower, but I caught it right afterwards in like two acres of cane and died. And it was, it was one plant. But very good flavor. Observations from, uh, from some of the early Euro-Americans about river cane. John Filson said on, in, in 1784 on Kentucky crane, cane breaks, many so thick and tall that it is difficult to pass through them. Bartram, when he came through in the 1770s, said, a cane break in Florida rolled out to the horizon like the ocean and was alive with cattle, deer, and turkeys. Henry Hammond in the 1860s in North Carolina observed vast breaks of cane often stretching in unbroken lines of evergreens for hundreds of miles. Edmund Ruffin in 1859 on the prairie lands of Alabama when the first settlements of Alabama were begun in 1817 Nearly all of this broad space was covered by a thick undergrowth of cane. John Drayton, uh, in the upcountry of South Carolina, at the first settlement of the state, the valleys of the middle and upper country, then in the possession of Indians, encouraged plentiful growth of cane. And Benjamin Hawkins, uh, in the late 1700s, in his evaluation of the poor creek lands in Georgia, he was excited when he came to cane because cane indicated uh, good rangeland and fertile soils. Estimates of cane growth at, the, at this time was so high as 10, as 10 million acres. Today, they estimate that 2% still exists, but I think that is a highly optimistic figure. It's probably well below 1%. Uh, and it's becoming scarcer and scarcer as we live and breathe. So. Why did the cane breaks disappear? And a cane break 
is a dense monotypic stand of Arundin area. Part of it was grazing. Cane is very sensitive to moderate grazing and continuous grazing will cause its rapid decline. Um, destroying the rhizomes will also stop regeneration of stands. And fires were ignited to encourage growth of new foliage, which would be rapidly consumed by livestock. Cane was also an indicator of soil fertility, the tallest cane growing on the best soils. Uh, when the rhizomes made it difficult to plow, the quality of the soil beneath, the, while, while the rhizomes made it difficult to plow, the soil beneath the cane break made it worth the effort because it was where the good soils were. And of course, later on development, uh, flood control projects, you know, East Tennessee, there was cane along all the rivers, uh, flood control projects, reduced the natural flooding cycle and uh, that maintained cane breaks in bottomland areas. And uh, today in the mountains, especially in the mountainous regions of the, of the South, prime cane growing areas are the first to see development because it grows on the flatlands and not much comes through a Walmart parking lot. So, so why I grow river cane? He has good questions. River cane is fabulous wildlife habitat. Uh, frontier naturalist Gideon Lincecum called, uh, called cane the great sanctum sanctorum, the inner chamber of the great hunting ground. Large animals thrive with river cane. Uh, deer will graze on it, bears love it. The eastern buffalo, they think, was, was really connected with the river cane, elks. Um, it's, it's fantastic graze. Smaller animals also did well in the cane. Turkeys, it gave them great cover and a lot of food. Um, they think the passenger pigeon was, was associated with river cane. Um, there are a couple, uh, Swainson's warbler and I forgot the name of the other one, but a couple of warblers. Um, they were river cane uh, specialists. They would uh, build their nests in cane. And the little bunny up there is the cane break rabbit. So he needs no introduction. Well, he got one. Uh, there were insects who were cane break specialists. Uh, there were uh, five species of skipper and two species of pearly eye that are specialists in cane break. Uh, they lay their eggs in there. Their, their larvae feed on cane. Domesticated animals do really well with cane. Because it was a... Every, it has an evergreen habit. You can, it's easy to, in the winter time because when you're driving along the river, you see these tall green areas. Um, so it stays evergreen, provides nutritious forage all winter long. Um, goats did really well with this because the protein content was constant from, from its peak in late summer. And goats are susceptible to parasites from low brows, and there is no low brows in river cane. They say horses that were fed on cane were said to work as well as corn-fed horses. And hogs would avidly seek out the ri and devour the rhizomes, um, which was great for the hogs, but not too good for the cane. Cattle. Uh, I couldn't find a picture of uh, cattle in uh, cane break, but I found a song. And y'all can hum along if you like, if you can read music. Uh, cane break's cattle gave cattle year-round cover and continuous grazing. Cattle's fed on cane showed significant weight gain, produced a 95% calf crop, and gave excellent quality milk and butter. So super nutritious stuff and was wonderful for the cattle. So it, it was, if, you were, if you were looking for a new piece of land, piece of land to settle and you had, you, know, you had your livestock with you, seeing river cane would be exciting. Even if there were other factors you weren't sure about, um, and then you, you would also know that underneath that cane, you were going to find some good rich soil. And we'll talk about that too in a minute. Stream protection. This is probably, um, I probably have given more talks to watershed associations than anybody else for river cane because it is fantastic. Uh, preliminary studies, in, and I say preliminary studies because Nobody really started looking into river cane. There were no articles published on it until about 1999. So this is new research, relatively. I mean, 
It was new when I started. Um, but preliminary studies indicate that a 10 meter river cane riparian buffer can reduce dissolved nutrients and sediment from agricultural runoff more effectively than a similar 10 meter forest buffer. Nitrogen compounds, river cane will take out up to 100% of nitrogen compounds. Uh, it'll take up 28 to 100% of the phosphate that's coming off the field. Uh, sediment, 100%. So what happens when, um, when river cane, when a river comes out of its bank, if there's river cane there, the, the water is so slowed by the dense river cane that the sediment gets, has time to settle out. So I've tried to sell an a Army Corps of Engineers engineer on River Cane one time, and they don't listen to anybody. <laughs> but uh, this, is, this is really fantastic. And, well, I think we're going to look at a couple of projects here. One project we did was uh, Chituga Town was an old uh, 17th century or 18th century Cherokee town site um, right in... Right when you come, you're coming down and there's that corner where Georgia and South Carolina kind of overlap a little bit. Right when you come into South Carolina, Chattooga Town would have been right there on the Chattooga River. Uh, 29 acres were used to the test management regimes for cane. And much of the area was burned one year to see what, the, to follow the effects of, of fire on cane. And several acres have been tr transplanted to increase the area down there. Uh, this is the site. And you can see all those hash marked areas are where the cane was going to be. Um, I retired like three months before COVID hit. So I haven't been involved with much of anything since then. And if I'd have waited three months and kept my job, I'd have got paid to stay home. But timing is everything. Uh, but this area was, is the biggest project of its type in the region. Um, I don't know how many students are actually looking into it. I think some have finally gone down to follow up on what happened with the burn regime and all that. The, uh, there's, like, there's like a whole bunch of people that work in the national forest who are firebugs, and you start talking about fire and they get that bright look in their eyes. Um, they're really excited about it, and uh, they, um, they, really, they were really jazzed about this place. So River King enhances stream bank stabilization so it protects, river, it protects riparian areas in a flooding event. And the sediment, sediment trapped by water is slowed, and, and it creates natural levees for high water events. There was one, um, one cane break outside, right outside of Cherokee. And it was right off the highway, so nobody ever went back in there. And looking in there, and there was a three-foot levee between the Tuckasegee River and the, um, and the river bank. And where the cane had just allowed that sediment to build up and build up and build up. So what happens, too, is um, a lot of the, the good stuff in the water settles out and you get good garden soils. So river cane stops that. There was a place when I started uh, the project in 2004. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers that year, but we had two hurricanes back to back. And... Um, there was a whole lot of flooding. I mean, I, I, the first night in my new house, I was driving out and I couldn't get there because the river had come up. But um, so the folks in Cherokee at the extension office told me that out at um, the Gadua site where, there was, where the, the cane that I saw flower was, they said everywhere there was, there was a patch of cane between the river and the field, nothing washed out. Any place there was a gap in the cane, there were huge washouts. And we uh, did another project up in, um, near Burnsville. And the fellow up there said, uh, you know, was, was talking to a farmer that had owned the land previously. And he said, we always, and here in the mountains, we always kept river cane around the fields where we could just for that reason. Because you were going to get, it was going to flood. And where there was river cane, you had less damage in your fields. Now, there's another type of cane that also grows in the mountains. Uh, river cane is, is Appalachia, is Arundinaria gigantea, and hill cane is Arundinaria Appalachiana. It was named in 2006. Um, it's called, the Cherokee call it arrow cane. 
It's also called hill cane. And it's much smaller. And you'll see the difference. On your left is the uh, hill cane. On the right is river cane. And you see the chamber is really big. And the arrow cane is almost solid. Uh, I've seen one really good patch of this. And it's at an old uh, Cherokee mound site up in Cowie. And there's fields of it. It must be three acres of this cane. It gets about four feet tall. And it's almost solid. You, if you cut it, you, you'll just, it's cane straight through. Uh, supposedly, it made a really nice, dense arrow. Um, some people make their arrows out of river cane, but this hill cane is, is superior. Now, it was named in, in 2006, but you'll see that in the uh, 1820s and 30s, the Payne Butrick papers, they wrote, there is a kind of small cane growing in the mountains, heavy in heart of texture, called kani. And as arrows generally were made of this, they were also called by the same name. On becoming acquainted with lead, they also gave balls the same name, as they were heavy and used in shooting. But this is the distribution of Arundinaria Appalachiana. And as you can see, it is the southern Appalachians. It is just down at the, at the very end of all things. And, um, You'll see it, you'll, you, you'll, you'll be surprised to see cane, you'll be up in the forest and you'll be on an upland area and you see this little low cane in the woods and some, you know, mostly it's two, three feet tall. Um, it's most likely Arundinaria Appalachiana. Um, but like I said, it's also deciduous. So while, um, while Giant cane it will be evergreen. This loses its leaves every fall. And you see the cane, and you think, oh, the cane died. And then the next year, it'll come back with new leaves. So definitely different species. I want to touch on this because I get this question a lot. And um, once you learn this, you'll never have to ask me any questions. This is the general differences between cane and bamboo. Cane combs or stems are round and have no sulcus or groove. Bamboo will always have a pronounced groove on the stem. Cane is generally under 20 feet tall and usually around an inch in diameter. Bamboo can be up to 70 feet tall and up to 6 inches in diameter. Cane has a stiff, straight shape with short branches. Bamboo has long, slender branches and a wispy look to it and will lean into prevailing winds. Cane has a persistent comb leaf sheaths. Those are sheaths that grow right at the joints of the, of the cane. Um, river cane, they stay on it up to three years. As a matter of fact, when I went out with the basket makers, that's how they would age the cane. Um, their cane needed to be at least three years old before it was suitable for harvest. And they would look to make sure all the comb leaf sheaths had fallen off. Bamboo sheaths will fall off as the, the bamboo comes up. So you'll see a big pile of them on the ground, um, never on the, on the stem. And river cane has deep, strong roots that stabilize stream beds. Bamboo roots are weak and shallow by comparison with taller above ground portions, and they lead to more erosion. So if you're thinking of uh, doing erosion control, definitely stick with river cane. There's things we need to know. There's things that... Um, you know, especially up around where we are, where is the river cane in western North Carolina and in the surrounding areas? A lot of it was mapped, um, but every now and then, this, you know, we hear about a new place. You can't look everywhere. Uh, how does river cane respond to fire in the mountains? You know, we, most of the reports we had of it were down in the Piedmont area where they, you know, would, when they would burn it, it said it sounded like cannons going off because it, uh, the, the chambers would explode, the gases would heat up and they'd explode. And they sounded like guns going off and they thought there was a little battle going on and it came up and it was just the natives burning the, the river cane breaks. We don't know, uh, we don't know the best way to transplant or pro propagate river cane. Uh, we've had people working on it and uh, it's, you know, it, the, the hardest thing with uh, um, when people say, oh, we, you know, we've got a conservation problem, we'd like to get some river cane, where can we get it? 
and that's always a problem. And it's it's tricky. Like I said, when we would dig up, you know, we would cut the comb at about four feet, dig up um, at least a foot of rhizome on either side, and plant that. And you have to do it when it's damp and cool. Um, but it, it took up to five years before we saw any real life coming out of it. So it was always a slow process. How can river cane fit into an agroforestry system? Um, you know, how do you grow the best cane? What grows best with cane? Um, cane tends to, it tends to overshadow everything. I mean, it, it takes up all the light. Um, I remember one area, we just decided to let this cane grow into a small section of field over near Cherokee. And there was fescue there. And fescue's tough. Fescue's hard to kill. And even when the cane started coming into that fescue, it, would, it was dying out. So it's quick. Um, will it, you know, some people wonder, will, you know, Japanese knotweed is such a problem in the southeast. Will river cane outcompete that? We don't know. So there's still a lot of questions. Is river cane a serviceable biofuel? Um, I don't know. One of, one of the neat projects we ran into was the uh, How Many Creek Inca Candler Greenway, and if you look where that, that little school on the left, left center, Sand Hill Venable Elementary School, they're putting in a greenway down there, and that was one of the prime uh, harvesting places where the Cherokee would have around Asheville. This is the biggest cane break I know of around the Asheville area. Um, they're putting a greenway in there, and early on we worked with them to, to try and preserve the cane. What happens in the future, I don't know. But we found, came across this, this agreement between America Inca and uh, the Cherokees from the Oconalefti Indian Village. This is in May 1969, and you know, of course we met in council, we smoked a pipe, we did this or that. And uh, I always love that they end these things with, be it resolved that these parties and given and give and, and evidenced by these articles of agreement that this accord shall endure so long as the green grass grows and the rivers flow. I think uh, every Indian in, in the in in the continental United States has heard those words before, <laughs> but. Because this land is now going to be a greenway, because it's going to be conservation land, and um, we think you know, that they're going to preserve this river cane, and it, it is good quality cane. Okay, and if, and if you need it, you want any additional information, the USDA Giant Cane Plant Guide, it's online, it's free. Um, this is fantastic. Uh, a uh, woman named Kat did this. She, uh, she wrote uh, like books on, she wrote a book on harvesting um, acorns in California. I'm trying to remember Kat's last name, but it's not coming to me. But she, she def was the editor on this thing, and uh, she sent it to me and said, look this over and give me some feedback, and it was perfect. It was so good. So it's, it's, a, it's a, just your regular standard plant guide for giant cane. Um, but it'll give you, as, you know, it, it looks at it from, from every aspect. So they, just, they did a really nice job on it. Any questions? Yes? Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, get it back. We'll go another one. Yes? That's going to be a battle. That's going to be a battle. All right, I'm going to give you a little information. <laughs> yeah.
You know, when they decided to bring kudzu into the southeast for erosion control, they really wanted to develop a, a, some good, vigorous, fast-growing kudzu. Guess where they developed it? University of Georgia. <laughs> so the, the, the kudzu that grows 13 inches in a night, that was developed right here. <laughs> I've looked for a plaque to it. I, I can't find it. <laughs> yes? No, there hasn't, but it's, it's, like I said, it's not a good um, wetland plant because it needs to drain soil. But because it, um, it is so good at, at taking out nitrogen and phosphates, I think I would love to see it you know, like down in the eastern part of the Piedmont where the chicken farms are. If they would put river cane between the fields where they put the chicken manure on, I think there'd be a lot less runoff. They've tried, and I th they, may, they may be better at it. Like I said, it's been a few years since I've, I've kept up with it. Uh, but one of the problems is it is a grass. And so you get to see, you know, it's hard to distinguish river cane from, from grasslands. Um, they may have gotten better with it. Um, but, yeah, we, we, we were hoping somebody would come up with that because that would be a really easy way to, to do conservation. Yes. They're pretty much the easiest way to do conservation of river cane is find it where it is and keep it where it is because that's where it shows to grow. Some of it can be very old. Um, I've heard, let's see, of flowers. I want to say like every 25 to 50 years. So, you know, you can, you can be looking at some cane that's been there for a long time. And sometimes you'll have, like, two clones, and one will flower and one won't, and then the one that didn't flower will just move into that area. Um, now, I, I have seen it when it went to seed, and I got there too late to collect seed, but there was a layer of seeds on the ground, like that thick, and they were all sprouting. So you get, it was almost like turf. It was so thick. Um, yeah, did that answer your question? Uh, yeah. yeah, just like if where it is now is probably like maybe some really old path. Right? Yeah, and, and you know, you'll see some, like it used to be down, I, I haven't been down to the uh, botanical gardens in a while, but it used to be, I used to walk the trails down by the river there, and you would see one or two combs shoot up here and there. Um, it's, it'll grow with, it'll grow right up to a, like a walnut tree. So it's, it's real hardy. Uh, it'll take over. It, it can shade out anything underneath it. Um, but it does well under trees too. It's just, you know, a balance between, it's still going to need some light. Uh, if, I, if I was looking for it, I just, I go around in the winter when the leaves are off the trees and when you're driving along the river, um, you'll, it's the best time to see it. One thing that it, it doesn't outcompete is um, privet. And I remember driving through Alabama, going to uh, Mississippi, and looking along the rivers and looking for cane, and all I saw was privet along there. So that is, privet is a problem in the battle. Um, I've seen it coexisting with, uh, with kudzu, but... You know, it's, it's going to, I don't know who's going to win that war. Yes? Pigs are known to eat, definitely eat the rhizomes, so 
Um, I would say when they can get to it, they would, and they would cherish it. So yeah, it would be a problem. Um, and it, it's, it's a pretty broad area. It surprised me. Some, somebody was talking about wild boar the other day and talking about how far they range. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's definitely a problem. Anything else? Yes. Uh huh. Yes. Yeah. Well, when I when I started doing this, not many people were talking about River Cane, and I considered myself a River Cane evangelist. And this is a prime example. Charles just took off and ran with it. He came to a talk I gave. That was one of the first ones. It was one of your first classes. And uh, he came and he heard the word on River Cane. So go forward and spread the word, people. It's a great plant. As you can see, it's, it's just, it's had so many uses. And, and um, you know, we know what bamboo is to, in, in Asian countries. You know how important it is in Asian countries. Um, this is our bamboo. This is, this is home. <laughs> All right, thank you much.